Welcome to the HPQ College of Law webinar on dispute resolution and blockchain in collaboration with Jure, a legal tech app currently developing the world's first multi-jurisdiction online dispute resolution platform. I'm George Dimitropoulos, a faculty member at HPKU College of Law, and will be moderating today's session. According to Vitalik Buterin, the co-founder of Ethereum, one of the most successful blockchains, a blockchain is a magic computer that anyone can upload programs to and leave the programs to self-execute, where the current and all previous states of every program are always publicly visible and which carries a very strong crypto-economically secured guarantee that programs running on the chain will continue to execute in exactly the way that the blockchain protocol specifies. The digital world and its legal ramifications are becoming ever more important after the COVID-19 pandemic crisis. Jure's core team is here with us today to help demystify the magical qualities of blockchain and the so-called Lex Cryptographia, and we'll be discussing blockchain, smart legal contracts, and online dispute resolution. The first speaker for today is Raffaele Battaglini, Chief Legal Officer of Jure, who will be speaking on smart legal contracts. Raffaele is an attorney, founder of Battaglini de Sabato Law Firm, and offers legal advice to SMEs and startups in the fields of innovation and blockchain technology. He is a co-organizer of Illegal Hackers Torino. Our second speaker is Luigi Cantizani, a legal engineer at Jure, who will be speaking on online dispute resolution. Luigi is a lawyer at Battaglini de Sabato Law Firm, providing legal advice in the field of corporate law and commercial contracts to SMEs and startups. Our third speaker is Alessandro Palombo, the CEO of Jure, speaking on the road to decentralization. Alessandro is a tech entrepreneur with a legal background. He's the CEO and founder of Jure, as well as uh, several other tech initiatives. And we also have with us uh, today, uh, Luca Daniel, the CTO of Jure, who will not be presenting, but will be answering questions from the audience and coordinating the team's answers. Luca is an, inv in inv is an investor in the field of blockchain, as well as an advisor for Blockchain India. Without further ado, allow me to give the floor, please, to our first speaker, Raffaele. Hello, Georgios. Thank you very much for this presentation. Thank you, everyone, for being here today with us. Um, my, my topic is smart legal contracts, but of course, in order to do so, we need first to understand what smart contracts uh, are. And so there is a very famous sentence concerning smart contracts, which is smart contracts are neither smart nor contracts. Um, and we could uh, challenge this sentence, and we will try to do this during this presentation um, according to the time uh, that, have, that has been given to me. Um, so first of all, it is important to uh, clarify that smart contracts are not something that was born with blockchain, but it's something that uh, goes to 1994 uh, when Nick Zabo, who was who is a computer scientist with a background in in law, um, theorized these smart contracts as a computerized transaction protocol that executes the terms of a contract, um, where smart contracts are something that is uh, easier to be adopted, to be used, that create efficiency, and that should avoid the breach of contracts. Um, in 1995, Nick Zabo suggested a new um, definition of smart contracts, where he pointed out also that artificial intelligence is not implied within the meaning of smart contracts. And eventually, we have the final definition in 1996, whereby a smart contract is a set of promises specified in digital form, including protocols within which the parties perform on these promises. But the smart contracts became mainstream or popular, or at least more um, recognized, only after the Ethereum blockchain was launched. Uh, and this happened in uh, 2014-2015. Ethereum uh, is the first blockchain that was developed specifically for smart contracts, uh, which comprises uh, something like an operating system that allows the development of software, which are called smart contracts, and DApps, decentralized applications. And uh, Vitalik Buterin, who 
uh, is the uh, inventor of Ethereum, uh, decided to adopt the uh, terminology smart contract to um, uh, give a proper name to the permanent script adopted by the Ethereum blockchain in order to allow the creation of software. And such software are developed uh, with a specific um, programming language that is called Solidity. So, Solidity is the programming language that was born with Ethereum for the development of smart contract of, on that specific platform. In this, um, on this slide, on, on, on the left hand side of this slide, you can see an actual uh, smart contract. This is how a smart contract appears to a viewer. Uh, you will see that uh, the, the, the functions are expressed with this uh, Solidity programming language, but please keep in mind that also natural language can be added in between those lines. In order to provide background clarification on the uh, meaning of the programming language. And so smart contracts are event-driven software, uh, so they rely on an event that then allow the execution of the functions embedded within the, the, the uh, software. Um, in order to give execution, give performance to obligations that have been uh, written, developed within the smart contract. But a very critical point is the source of this event. If a smart contract is a event-driven software, this means that the event is crucial in order to uh, have the smart contract perform what it was supposed to do. If this event is an information that resides within the blockchain itself, no actual issues arise. The issues arise when the event is outside a, a blockchain. So it's off-chain, it's not on-chain. If this event is off-chain, then we need some source of information that is called Oracle. And almost anyone and anything can theoretically be an Oracle. An Oracle can be a user, an institution, a company, or also a sensor. So we can also adopt um, Internet of Things along with the blockchain technology and smart contracts or a software. A software, for example, scraping the Internet, looking for specific information. Um, and so we should now ask ourselves how a smart contract that it is a software can actually relate or simulate or maybe substitute a traditional contract. In my personal view, there are two possibilities. One is that the smart contract is just a tool to automate the execution of specific certain provisions of a traditional contract. And in this case, my suggestion would be to insert some kind of language of wording within the traditional contract specifying, explaining that uh, certain provisions will be managed through a smart contract. And maybe the parties should also decide on which blockchain the smart contract should be developed, and maybe also which developer should actually develop that smart contract. On the other side, we have smart contracts that can substitute as a whole the contract. This, of course, would be possible only for contracts re, uh, relating to very specific and very simple, very objective um, provisions. Some um, contracts very, very, very simple. Otherwise, my suggestion would be to have a traditional contract that allow the parties to adopt the smart contract technology for the performance of specific conditions. And at the end, the final question would be, 
if a smart contract has some kind of link with a traditional contract, so it becomes a smart legal contract, do the contract law would apply or not? Well, my personal opinion, my personal view would be that if the smart contract is just a tool, then there would be no uh, actual implications from a contractual point of view because the traditional contract would be regulated by contract law. But if we actually are able to uh, develop a smart contract, including also natural language, and this is absolutely possible, um, if that hybrid of programming language and human language if meet the requirements of a contract under the applicable contract law, in my personal view, would be a contract and the contract law would be actually applicable. So if that specific hybrid would um, include an offer, an acceptance, the meeting of the minds, the description of the um, performances and the consideration, that in my personal view would be a document an electronic document subject to the contract law of that specific jurisdiction. So that smart legal contract would have a binding legal effect. And the actual challenge would be how to practically apply contract law to that document. Because if we consider that a smart contract is developed on a blockchain and that the parties cannot uh, modify, amend, the smart contract, that the issue is how to actually, to actually implement the contract law to a tool that the parties, and nor even the judge, can actually manipulate, amend, or modify uh, somehow. Uh, this would end the, 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 the first part of the presentation. Uh, because uh, next, if we have time, we can talk about a specific use case, uh, but I would ask Georgios if this is possible or if we want to do in another occasion. Uh, I think that makes uh, perfect sense. Uh, may I please ask you, you know, is a, a, a one or two follow-up uh, questions, uh, specifically sure. on the interrelationship between uh, smart contracts and you know smart legal uh, contracts, right? It seems that uh, smart contracts are not as flexible as traditional uh, contracts because they are self-executing, correct? In light of this, uh, how can the terms of a smart contract be uh, varied? or renegotiated, right, as case uh, may be. And what happens in case of breach of the terms of a smart contract? How can uh, traditional legal issues be resolved, uh, be resolved for that matter? Sure, well, um, the first point is that um, when developing a smart contract, both a lawyer and a developer should be involved, especially if the smart contract has some legal implications. Because in my uh, experience, there should be an exchange of ideas because the developer has his own set of rules, set of uh, approaches, and the lawyer have the expertise concerning how contractual relationship may evolve during the time. So for example, it is possible to insert in a, a smart contract the possibility to provide new uh, elements, new information, new data, or uh, also to destroy a smart contract. But if these uh, features, if these needs are not um, expressed to the, the developer, the developer would not take into consideration these, uh, these needs. This is the reason why it is important that lawyer and developer work together side by side when developing a smart contract with legal implications. Because if we need to think about a withdrawal right or the necessity to uh, modify a formula for the calculation of a price, we need to say this in advance to the, to the developer so that he can create the appropriate tools to allow later on this kind of 
interaction with a smart contract. Otherwise, that would not be possible. Um, and this goes also with your second question concerning uh, how to apply the, the, the contract law. Um, again, the lawyer should be in charge, should take responsibility of understanding all possible scenarios in advance, explain the possible outcomes to the developer, and identify the technical solution that is uh, consistent with the legal implications and the legal necessity. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Rafaele. Uh, uh, it was uh, very clear. And let me give the first bit to Luigi, who will be following up on some of the aspects that uh, Rafaele uh, raised, but will be discussing more of the dispute resolution uh, aspects thereof, right? Exactly. Thanks for presenting me. It's a pleasure being here. We are going to uh, talk about online dispute resolution and specifically uh, the role that online dispute the resolution may play to evolve access to law and justice. And this will be clarified uh, pretty soon. Actually, uh, what does it mean online dispute resolution? Well, most of us are familiar with the notion of ADR, alternative dispute resolution, mm, which a definition that includes uh, methods such as mediation, conciliation, uh, in the United States, this definition also uh, includes arbitration, while in Europe is considered in a different way. But anyway, uh, it generally includes any methods for resolving disputes uh, other than domestic litigation. These methods were uh, developed as a solution to avoid uh, going before a court, uh, um, incurring certain costs, uh, duration of proceedings, you know, this kind of issues that can result in frictions while conducting business. And this mindset also applies to online transactions. As a matter of fact, the notion of online dispute resolution came to light, uh, let's say, with the advent of online platforms and specifically platform for e-commerce. Uh, you know, in the aftermath of this event, uh, we have many transactions happen uh, everywhere at any time. And of course, civil litigation before domestic cars cannot, uh, you know, catch up with that. It's too much, too quickly. And of course, um, the idea is that one size does not fit all, fit all, so any kind of claim needs is meted dispute resolution method that applies to, let's say, uh, justice that is practiced in uh, before uh, ADR uh, bodies, but that also applies to online transactions. And this is how uh, ODR systems came to light, systems that most of us uh, are familiar with, systems such as eBay, PayPal, many, sometimes people use the system without even knowing that they are dealing with an ODR system, but indeed they are, because the systems prevent disputes or, let's say, uh, resolve disputes without resorting to uh, a judge. And this is where, um, let's say, some experiments that include blockchain and smart contracts come into play. Nowadays, the ODR scene uh, is quite fragmented. There are so many experiments and implementations, and I usually provide this um, classification in order, you know, this sort of categorization in order to make things more clear. Uh, not everything can be truly considered ODR, and above all, um, we must say that ODR, that include blockchain and smart contracts, are still in the initial phase of development. So, just to uh, provide a quick framework. On the one hand, we just have online features, all right? So, features that are meant to streamline certain procedural phases. Uh, this means that not the entire uh, 
dispute resolution uh, proceedings happens online, but just the face of it. For instance, submitting the claim or uh, managing a notification, something like that, or virtual hearings, for instance. On the other hand, we have mechanisms that have been defined as uh, electronic ADRs, and that are the most interesting ones because, uh, I mean, that's been the most interesting one so far because I've kind of imitated what uh, we used to do with traditional methods, so negotiating, mediating, uh, submitting this to arbitration, but in an online form, at least partially at least partially. Of course, some of these experiments have been used to make improvements to civil proceedings, and so I believe that in, that ha happens in your cards, for sure it happens in Italy and in other countries. But now you can submit, for instance, uh, the statement of claim online, at least for certain procedures. There are things that can be managed online, and this is how all the experiments made, uh, that have been done in the, um, in the ODR sector are helping to improve civil proceedings. But the most uh, experimental, let's say, part of this scene is for sure the automated ODR scene, which includes blockchain and ODR, which includes, in other words, algorithms for resolving disputes. Uh, there have been experiments in this regard, and I would like to mention just a few ones. For instance, CyberSaddle was a mechanism that used uh, algorithms for resolving uh, disputes arising out of insurance claims. So party A submitted, used to submit its proposal, party B its own proposal, and then the algorithms uh, found a a balance, try to strike a balance uh, to, uh, let's say, solve the dispute. So proposing an allocation of sum that could be acceptable for both parties. Uh, Smart Settle is kind of based on, uh, a I mean, is based on a mechanism derived from Cycle Settle, which is named Visual Blind Bidding. So the party, in this case, don't know exactly what the other party is meant to, is willing to accept. And, but the system relies on algorithms for resolving disputes. It's completely uh, automated. Like, automation is applied to the decision-making process. Algorithms make the decision, in other words. Another interesting experiment was uh, iCartel, basically a platform where user uh, could be parties to a dispute or decision-makers. So an interface open to both roles, let's say. And this was interesting because it was maybe the first website that opened up to the idea of a community where users can be both parties and decision makers. Some of the most advanced experiments, which failed, by the way, include the virtual magistrate, basically an experiment to bring American um also conducted by the American Arbitration Association, to, to bring arbitral proceedings online. And another interesting experiment was the Michigan Cyber Court, which was basically an experiment to bring a court for business and commercial disputes entirely online. So one experiment regards, uh, is related to our commercial arbitration, and the other one to civil commercial, uh, I mean, to commercial proceedings before domestic courts. They both were, they were both unsuccessful, but you know, there is a lot that we can learn from this lesson, especially in light of uh, recent data provided by the OECD. According to the OECD estimation, today only the 46% of human beings live under protection of the law, while more than 50% humans are active interest, internet users. This tell us basically that it's easier to access internet than accessing justice. And so all these experiments are important today more than ever because we can learn from those experiments and use justice, let's say, as a Trojan horse to bring justice uh, everywhere, kind of everywhere, like making justice, access to justice uh, better, easier.
And I like to always mention this quote from Franz Kafka, which says that law should be accessible to everyone at any time. And that's exactly what blockchain and smart contracts can do. They can be used to implement algorithms to automate. So look back at, at the example of Cyber Saddle, which used algorithms to automate the dispute, um, the dispute resolution mechanism. Blockchain allows you to set up platforms where communities decide. So think of, the, look back at the example of iCart House, but think that in light of the implementation of blockchain and smart contracts. You can use these technologies to invent brand new ODR mechanism in the same way uh, CyberCell was something completely new when it was firstly released. Or you can replicate mechanisms that already exist but by using blockchain as smart contract. So think of the example of the virtual magistrate that experiment for bringing online arbitral proceedings. Now that can be done and it can be done even better thanks to blockchain and smart contracts. Uh, thank you. Luigi, very much. Let me ask a couple of questions on my uh, side, and then you know uh, I'll provisionally ask uh, the two of you, you know, some questions which uh, you will have the chance to uh, uh, respond to at the end of our uh, during our Q and A session. Uh, now, how exactly are smart contracts enforced by uh, ODR? It would be uh, great if you could illuminate uh, us uh, on this. And what advantages can blockchain bring to, to dispute resolution specifically in uh, ODR, right? So the exact relationship between, you know, the blockchain on the one side and uh, uh, ODR, if you could elaborate a little bit, you know, in, uh, in greater uh, detail. And do you think that uh, uh, smart contracts or blockchain in general can, can help in cutting down procedural costs as well as the time for dispute resolution? Yeah, sure. Let me answer your question. So, um, first of all, as you said, how can we solve disputes that arise out from smart contracts? How ODR can help this? Well, that's the interesting point. Uh, if you have smart contracts and a dispute comes out and you don't have an abandoned ODR, so a system for resolving disputes that is also based on blockchain and smart contracts, exactly as the contract is, you have a sort of gap. So what would you do in that case? You would go before a court, you would say, this is what happened. Oh, uh, please judge. I know that the contract cannot be reversed because, you know, blockchain is immutable, the transactions cannot be reversed, but you can ask let's say, uh, a measure that compensates that. So the judge may ask, for instance, to reallocate the sum that was moved by, uh, by the smart contract. But for sure, this is tricky. It takes time, it increases cost, and it basically uh, neglects all the advantages that blockchain and smart contracts bring. What if you have an embedded system? Like, let's do an example. What if, in the very moment, party B breaches the contract, you can, by simply clicking on your computer, start a dispute and the input that you give becomes an extraction that basically uh, trigger another smart contract, but a smart contract that, let's say, is in charge for handling disputes. You know, when we draft clauses, we are familiar with the idea of multi-layered clause. You know, for instance, if there is a disagreement, the party may appoint a third expert, a third party expert that decides on the matter. If the experts cannot provide an opinion, party go on mediation, and so on and so forth. But that idea can be transposed on smart contracts and blockchain. You can have, let's say, multi layered system in which if there is a disagreement, that disagreement becomes the extraction for another smart contract that manages the dispute. And that's the advantage of having both on the same platform. And we tested that with the system developed at Jura. We did that also with students at universities. Uh, we split the class, and so uh, a student played the part of the claimant, another one played the role of the respondent, uh, so party A and party B, 
at some point they simulated a dispute, the system uh, allowed them to renegotiate the terms within a 24 hours. So before starting the dispute, they could change the, the amount, the allocation of the sum, or extend the duration of the contract. So in some way you could even, you know, modify uh, certain terms and reach an amicable solution. If expired after the expiration of that line, uh, no amicable settlement was reached, then the, the matter was basically submitted to other users who serve as decision makers. So other users of the same platform that play as decision makers. And that's possible only if the system, the contract, and the ODR are connected by smart contract. Because basically, what happens Negotiate. as a output of a smart contract serves as an input for the next smart contract that manages uh, the dispute. Uh, perfect. Thank you very much, Luigi. A, a preview questions that we will be asking during our Q&A. Uh, one of the questions is about a termination of a smart contract. You know, uh, it sounds like it never ends, right? I guess, you know, it would go to both of you, Rafael and uh, Luigi. And uh, uh, we do have a question on intellectual property rights and how they are reshaped, uh, shaped and reshaped in the particular field, as well as, you know, whether we have uh, uh, data on winners and the losers, right, in uh, OCR. But we let us take everything, you know, during the Q&A uh, uh, session. Uh, but uh, uh, before uh, addressing those questions, uh, let us go to uh, Alessandro uh, to deliver his own presentation. Hello, everyone. So I'm really glad to be here with you today. In my speech, I want to give you uh, an overview and, and uh, um, of something which is going to probably change the world in the next 10 or 15 years. Um, I'm, I always like to, um, I mean, mm, collocate the, uh, I mean, this kind of really short speech, remarking how, to some extent, it's like if today we are in 1995 for the internet. So, uh, for every one of you that are, that is probably a tech passion, passionate, this is a huge opportunity because uh, it is true that everything is still immature, but it is for exactly this reason that there is so much to do, and that's why it's so exciting to be here all together today. Um, let's understand quickly why I'm saying that and what is a DAP or decentralized application. In uh, technical terms, uh, as you know today, most of the applications, for example, Instagram or Twitter, they are running on a centralized server. This uh, technical aspect implies that every time you, for example, uh, connect over Instagram or over Facebook with other people, there is always a, an intermediary. There is Facebook Inc. in this case, which is, of course, managed and led by uh, one single person. His name is Mark Zuckerberg. Um, since 2014 and onwards, uh, as Raffaele explained to you, um, progressively, uh, a lot of people and tech enthusiasts uh, found really interesting uh, how it's possible to uh, use smart contracts for uh, creating new platforms where, or which means new applications, where uh, intermediary entities are reduced potentially to zero. Why? Because there is no a centralized server and rather there is a code which is running on a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer network which means, for one instant only, imagine Airbnb without Airbnb, where you can directly, through smart contract, book an apartment of someone else from on the other side of the world. And you and the counterparty are both safe thanks to the rules written in these smart contracts. Um, ideally, just to give you um, a bit more information, this is a two layers problem which might regard also not only the back end but also the front end. And at that level, there are already some solutions like IPFS, um, 
um, systems, which means essentially that uh, ideally also the front end of a website could be stored in a, let's say, decentralized server fashion to keep it really uh, simple and clear. Uh, this is explanation is not really helpful. It's, what is really helpful is to understand in light of these elements what uh, is going to change and why. Um, let me give you one example. Mm, probably most of you are users of Facebook or Instagram or Twitter. Let's use Facebook as an example. Um, today, when you, I mean, I don't know if you have seen recently the movie, uh, The Social Dilemma, right, which uh, discussed really widely about, you know, the usage of the data from um, social, I mean, um, platforms like Facebook, but what matters is that um, if you have a um, Facebook page and after a few years, after you um, created a, an amazing, let's say, number of followers and engagement, if, if after a few years you want to close your page, you're going to lose almost everything because it's the platform to keep the value of the relationships, of the data, of the connections, what does it mean? It means that uh, there is one entity, a central entity, that is keeping most of the value. This phenomenon can be described in general in most of the marketplaces or multi-sided platforms like a kind of approach which could be described like a, an S-curve. Why? Because at the beginning, the platform is really friendly. It's, it's, going, it's going to tell you, hey, please join me. I'm super uh, helpful for you, open, look how many features I have, and the platform is not going to extract value from you. After the platform goes, grows and grows, and maybe after the IPO of the company, then there is a, an interest from the platform perspective to extract value from the community, from the users. And at that point, there is a kind of friction in place. Why? Because you probably have read many times about privacy policy modifications or commercial strategy modifications and the platform by itself is fully empowered to do most of the modifications they want to do without i mean uh, giving uh, accountancy or accountability to anyone else so um, this kind of model has some problems for example when a new platform that at the beginning is really friendly um, is born let's say Instagram for Facebook, or maybe today, TikTok, a lot of users are going to move from one platform to a new one. And uh, the previous platform, for example, Facebook, probably will have to acquire the new one. And one interesting question, of course, it's a big, it's a small provocation, but one interesting question is, who is going to pay the acquisition of Instagram? The answer probably is that we are going to pay because we are maybe the companies that will still keep need to pay the advertising on that platform for running their business and so far and so on. Now, uh, some people, it's a few years that they are uh, saying, and we say also, that in certain sectors, at least in the next 10, 15 years, new models will be uh, put in place. These models will distribute differently the value, not only at the center of the platform, but among the stakeholders. This is what we can describe as decentralization at the business model of new platforms. Um, now, um, this kind of new redefinition of economic relationships uh, is going to be a trend. And uh, probably this is not the only trend that we should consider, but also, you know, decentralization at the governance level, which might touch the problem I was describing before regarding who is going to be able to change completely the commercial equilibrium in a platform with their users. Maybe in the future, these kind of decisions will be managed in a DAP involving the users. So that, let's make this example. If you are one of the largest YouTube channel today on YouTube, you don't have power. Maybe tomorrow, in 10 years, in 15 years, a decentralized version of YouTube might ideally give a bit of involvement. It depends on how the architecture is built 
to the large channel and he will be able to say and express his own interest. Eventually, these models could create a some inclusivity and cooperative phenomenon within the digital network. That's why they could be eventually more effective or they might increase sometimes the performance. One example of that today is over. You can Google it and give a look. By the way, this screenshot was to, has been taken a few weeks ago. I think that they recently deployed a new version. I just want to invite you to give a look at that. This is an example of a platform where there is no intermediary. For keeping it simple today, they do. Uh, they can be considered a betting platform where the odds are not established by one single company, but by the algorithm. Those algorithms are written, let's say, in smart contracts so that everyone can go there and check them. And to this platform, when you do a bet, it is a smart contract to connect your bet on one side with the multiple other counterparties. It's not really interesting today in terms of, you know, uh, maybe to see how much adoption there is there, but it's interesting as a trend for understanding what there is behind these models and how they could evolve in the next 10 years. Let's do another uh, example, mm, Airbnb. We can ask ourselves is if there might be one day the real need of a decentralized version of Airbnb where people can book the apartments without intermediary. One benefit could be to reduce a bit, you know, the costs because there is no anymore the intermediary fee. Maybe there might be other benefits in terms of transparency. My own view is that in a model like Airbnb, probably one day there will be maybe a niche of needs which could be satisfied better by the centralized model. But maybe this is not a sector, or maybe yes, who knows where decentralization will change the rules in the next, let's say, by 2030, 2035. Or maybe yes. Um, let's take an example that is close to us. You might know Rocket Lawyer or Legal Zoom, or um, in general, any uh, contract automation software where there is a legal tech company that automate the contract uh, creation so that the user can come in, answer to a simple list of questions, and create a contract. Technically, they are normally called do-it-by-yourself legal agreements. In, this is just an example, of course, for exercising altogether, we might ask ourselves, maybe in 10 years, there might be a kind of smart contract based platform where lawyers can go there, build their template, like, like using WordPress today for building your own website. And they can sell that automated template of smart legal contract to third parties. And everyone who wants to use that predefined smart legal contract is going to leave a fee to the creator. Could be this a possible future? Maybe yes, maybe no. We think that it could make sense, maybe in the long term, in the really long term, something like that. But why? Because you can empower on one side the lawyers, in this case, to do to use themselves the uh, a software and uh, to monetize their activity, scaling up to potentially thousands of users. Um, today, the DAP market is uh, really interesting for people that are passionate about it. I mean, that are really within the blockchain industry. Uh, the adoption is still a bit far, but in, this is going probably to change in three, four years from now. Um, of course, the first uh, application of the, um, this kind of um, technology could be considered more um, let's say, uh, advanced in sectors like gaming or betting, you can give a look when you want at dapradar.com and you can have your own tour about these applications. Now, uh, I would like to close telling you that uh, Azure, we are going to release in the next month the version one of a platform, which is a 
Global, the online dispute resolution platform, which progressively will embed these principles, both at product level, business model level, and governance level. We decided to adopt these principles in a progressive way because we think that product market fit, so to be really focused on customers, comes first. And then you can put decentralization when you complete all the necessary validation. In our answer and why we want to use this technology, it's really simple. We want to create one unique standard for online justice over 166 jurisdictions. We follow the ancestral model law on arbitration so that the legal validity of the, out the decision made on the platform is a fully legally binding arbitration. And the goal, the, the real vision behind is to provide for small and medium claims worldwide a really fast procedure for solving the dispute, accessible and extremely transparent. Why? Because all the principles I was mentioning to you in general are going to be applied in this platform for every single phase, aspect, architecture, revenue, distribution, among the stakeholders, arbitrators, digital arbitration chambers, and so on and so on. So that when a user comes there, they can check that the entire procedure is really transparent and therefore independent from political interferences and commercial interests, which is, in my opinion, one huge need that in this case, really decentralization could be a, an excellent use case. If you want to follow our next milestones, please, uh, you are free to, um, I mean, give a look to our website and uh, uh, we would be really glad to keep you posted about the next steps. So, uh, thank you. Uh, Georgios, I'm going to give you back my, uh, the stage. Thank you, Alessandro. Uh, I think uh, even for the ones that you know had not realized before, what is the role of decentralization and what is the role of blockchain in you know contributing towards decentralization? You know, I think it has become perfectly clear. Before going into uh, our actual Q and A session, uh, for one minute, you know, if you could you know delve uh, uh, lightly more into the point of uh, why decentralization is that important. Right? You mentioned for you know what you away from the Mark Zuckerbergs. Right, uh, who are developing the uh, the, um, uh, the 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 various uh, platforms? Right, you know uh, Zuckerberg has been replaced by Vitalik and Vlad is here, or you know uh, uh, hopefully by Alessandro and the team. Right. <laughs> well, uh, well, mm, thank you. But I mean, if we do properly our job, actually, we should not be the next, let's say, uh, central entity. Rather, maybe we should become a kind of decentralized entity, which, of course, in my opinion, the, the, the right balance between center and extrem extremities is going to be drafted in the next year. Probably there will be still a dualism, but the roots between, you know, stakeholder and owner of the platform maybe will be more you know fair, more inclusive, more cooperative. So if we do probably our job, probably <laughs> there won't be a kind of central uh, authority, which again, maybe in some areas is really justified. I want to clarify that I'm not saying that the world is going to become this one, but in several sectors, in my opinion, it's going to be a, a, a disruption. Uh, my answer to be short is uh, uh, in this phase of the market, in this in the current phase of the market, we are still really uh, early stage. So the rules of these games and the models, and that's why it's so interesting, are still being built and maybe a bit also in our sector by us. So what we find meaningful is, uh, Georgios, to distinguish decentralization at three different layers, because this is going to be, in my opinion, one common element over the next five years in many projects, business model, product features, and governance. These three layers imply different values and competitive advantages, um, I mean, compared to centralized solutions. And each one of them should be discussed really deeper. So uh, it, it depends. So uh, if we look at the business model, there is a different value distribution where ideally the YouTube, or the, the, the owner of a large channel of YouTube is going to get eventually more money. In, at the governance level, it means that his voice is going to be heard much, much more. And at, at the product features, it, it depends really on the application. In our case, just for giving one example of a really simple implementation we are going to validate and integrate, it's the randomized selection of the judge, 
who will, let's say, decide if someone is going to be the arbitrator for your case. It's going to be a smart contract transparently on certain input data that everyone can go and check. And this is an element, of course. Thank you, thank you. But, you know, that's a, a new a understanding of the natural judge, uh, I guess, right? You know, which makes uh, perfect sense in my uh, eyes and ears. Uh, perfect, you know, I've already hinted at some of the, uh, the questions and, you know, from what I can see here uh, on our tab, there is uh, one question on uh, confidentiality that we need to uh, address. And if we are uh, able to move now to some of the, the questions that are to be addressed to you, uh, let me see who should have uh, accumulated some of the questions. But if we can start addressing the, the questions that have been raised already, right? The, the four questions that I mentioned already. So termination of a smart contract, can it be terminated? Uh, number two, uh, uh, what happens with the copyright intellectual property uh, law, right, in this new decentralized environment? Uh, uh, winners, losers in the online environment, and whether we have any data uh, on this. And uh, uh, number four, the issue of uh, confidentiality of the data on the blockchain, right? These are uh, all very important uh, issues to be addressed. Now, uh, and we have a couple more uh, questions here. May I ask, uh, uh, you know, uh, each and every one of you to, uh, to uh, discuss the point that we just made for approximately, you know, four minutes in total. So one minute uh, each, if Luca is going to present to discuss uh, anything as well, so that, you know, we take a second round here. Uh, um, uh, from uh, our PowerPoint uh, uh, slide. Thank you so much. Good evening, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I think we can start definitely with the questions since the audience has been really engaged and participants, so it's really uh, good to see that. Uh, going with the first one from Susan, uh, how can you terminate a smart contract? Sounds like it never ends. Uh, that's, <laughs> that's correct. That's, I mean, uh, it's a fair observation. Um, in this specific case, uh, I just go back to you know uh, what Rafael has shared before, which is uh, a smart contract. Uh, it's it's uh, you know it's a software, it's a computer code, right? That needs to be well developed uh, at the beginning of uh, from the start, right? And that's where uh, we do need to have uh, lawyer and developer together to understand the actual legal requirements of the contract and you know the actual implementation of the contract. So, for example. If a smart contract is meant to end, okay, so for example, say that you have a smart contract that represents um, an exchange of goods that should happen within a specific date, okay, after that date, potentially the developer could insert a provision within the smart contract that destroys the, contract, the smart contract, and no one can, after that, interact with the smart contract. So, you know, uh, it all goes down, boils down to requirements from the parties that are getting into the contract. And, you know, generally this is, this should be suggested by, by, by lawyers, by professionals like you, like future professionals like you that need to understand how this technology works to be able to suggest in the best way to your clients. I don't know if uh, Rafa, you want to uh, chime in and complete what I said. Um, no, I, I mean, I think you, you tackle the, the, main points, maybe I can uh, suggest also that other uh, technical tricks can be used. For example, if a smart contract is linked to a wallet and that smart contract governs payment transfer of tokens, it is it could be possible just to stop feeding that wallet with tokens, with cryptocurrency, and so that smart contract will still be alive, but that could not work because there there would not be more cryptocurrencies to be to be taken so this is another possibility i think there is a great question regarding you know intellectual property law oh, sure. uh, which you might want to tackle rafa because yeah, it's, it's, sure. your, it's your no, uh, that's a very nice question good question um we need to first of all start from the beginning meaning that uh there are licenses governing this code and in this field, usually either one of two specific open source licenses are used. One is the GNU, General Public License, uh, the uh, GPL, GNU, General Public License, um, which include the so-called copyleft 
provision, meaning that any software that is developed using a piece of software licensed uh, under the GPL version 3 in, in particular, must be uh, shared and licensed according to the same rules and principles. The other license is the MIT license, which is the uh, opposite of the GNU license because of the GPL version 3 license because it doesn't have it doesn't include this copyleft uh, provision and so any developer can adopt a software licensed through the MIT license and is not bound to share or to relicense that software through the same license so the copyright matter is already taken into consideration with the adoption of either one of those two licenses, open source licenses. Thanks, Raffaele. And I think maybe, Georgios, we can address one uh, last question, probably, since we are running a bit out of time. Uh, the one on confidential, confidentiality you, of data, I think it's really a great question from Abdullah. Um, you know, I'll answer from the technical point of view. Luigi, maybe you can integrate uh, my answer. Um, so, Abdullah is asking on confidentiality of data, how can ODR and smart contracts ensure confidentiality uh, of the parties and their information, knowing that algorithms can be self-financing to achieve near perfection execution. So, basically, uh, when it comes to, you're completely right, Abdullah, uh, in uh, generally speaking, you know, uh, parties' uh, data, it's confidential and, you know, um, you don't really want to disclose uh, what's happening between you and your counterparty on a, on a public ledger like the blockchain, right? So generally speaking, all your platforms uh, that uh, do use the blockchain as a ledger to register and record data, um, they do not uh, register data directly. So it's not that you go to the smart contract, you read the smart contract, and you, know, you can see the details of the parties, uh, you can see you know, the, uh, the, the, the object of the contract, the, 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 you know, the KPIs, and so on and so forth. Uh, what happens generally is that in the smart contract, we do store an hash, which basically it's a string representation of that information, of the original information. For example, my name is Luca, and, you know, it will be like uh, one, two, three, four, okay? And whenever you do this process of uh, hashification, basically, whenever you put Luca inside, it will always give one, two, three, four. So what happens is that the smart contract is more like a support like a memory of what happened, for example, uh, in the contract, the, the provisions of the contract, but it does not contain the actual plain text of, you know, uh, I went into agreement with you, for example, or, or something like that. So only the original parties that have the original agreement can upload, archify it, and check on the smart contract that, you know, is actually uh, matching, okay? So that we have kind of a... Uh, an authorized way, an auditable way to check that that was the agreement, it was registered, and so on and so forth. More complex smart contracts can have, uh, you know, embedded behaviors, like, for example, I pay a, a certain amount on the smart contract, and the smart contract does something on, his, on, his, on its uh, hand. These kind of behaviors can be read from the smart contract, but not the actual input data, as far as it's well developed. There are, of course, smart contracts that do instead store data plain text, but that's not what an ODR platform will do since, you know, information should be confidential. Maybe Luigi, you can quickly skim through this and we give the uh, line back to Georgios. Yeah, thanks for your technical explanation. Uh, on the legal side of things, um, the first thing to keep in mind, obviously, when we're dealing with uh, personal data is how the GDPR um, works. And that's important because also non-European countries are adopting legislations that are inspired by the GDPR. And it's not by chance, it's not because the GDPR is Qatar, in fact, is an yeah. example. Okay. All right. And it's not because the GDPR is beautiful, it's business friendly at all. It's a matter of providing uniformity and harmonization between business. Because how can you do business that involves data if we are not dealing on 
I mean, within a sort of similar framework. And so data is part of business now, nowadays. And of course, uh, data legislation must, uh, let's say, uh, go with that, go with this flaw. And on the legal side of things, uh, you know, we should stop thinking in terms of uh, blockchain is decentralized, how can I make it GDPR compliant? It's not about that. It's a matter of making relationships between players compliant with legislation. So let's say that Jure is developing a platform. Okay, but what's the role of Jure? Is Jure that is uh, as really the ownership of data or is Jure just a service provider for, let's say, a digital arbitration chamber? Because if that's the case, Jure is more a provider and the arbitration chamber is the dust controller. That's the definition used by the GDPR. So let's stop being scared by technology and let's look at the way business relationships are handled in light of this existing legislation. And if you take into account certain technical measures, like storing certain data on chain and other data of chain, it's easier to deal with this sort of privacy uh, law compliance. Fantastic. Uh, if I may ask uh, uh, Luca, I guess, for 30 seconds to let us know how uh, uh, our students, you know, or other people have been interested in uh, uh, the blockchain technology to be involved with uh, Jure, and then let us uh, wrap up our session. Uh, thank you, Gergios. Yeah, for sure. Um, everyone uh, that joined, uh, you know, this event, it's free to follow us, of course, in our social channels, mostly Telegram. You can, uh, I mean, I'll just share the link. Uh, in a bit. Uh, we are also planning uh, an actually a uh, global internship program across the world and this will be uh, launched probably in a couple of months. So we are stay tuned for that because we would like to involve the best talents across the world and it will be wonderful to have uh, some applicants from uh, from Qatar, of course. So please stay tuned for that because we're looking forward to see, you know, uh, new law students, new law legal talent joining uh, the blockchain industry. From Jure for the wonderful presentation, very complex. And I would also like, on my behalf, to thank Sandy Amonis and Ezzedine Abdenebi for their very hard work in preparing this webinar. And many thanks, of course, as well to our audience for their participation and questions. And please do remain involved in our activities on law and technology, and we look forward to seeing you in one of our next events. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. See you next time. Bye bye.